Thursday. I've got my Thanksgiving tie on, actually. You can't see it, but it's covered with turkeys. Some <laughs> dear friends sent it to me. It's a rather nice tie, isn't it? <laughs> but it's wishing you all a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, this is not a Thanksgiving sermon. It, though, does have to do with Thanksgiving. Really, it's behind everything Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. We begin a new chapter this morning, and it's uh, certainly one of the great passages of the book of Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, which is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time together. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to be. When people think of John Calvin, they usually think of predestination and with good reason. He firmly believed and taught that. And all of the other doctrines of sovereign grace, unconditional election, justification by faith alone. But Calvin was no cold logician, just the opposite. His grasp of grace gave him a warm devotion to God. His official seal pictured a hand holding a heart as an offering to God with the motto, prompt and sincere. That is the kind of people we are to be. And that is what Paul urges us to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where he states that we are to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices. This begins a new portion of the book of Romans in which Paul moves from doctrine to duty, from belief to behavior, from creed to conduct. This is Paul's pattern in many of his letters. He explains truth and then he applies the truth. And so Paul's emphasis now shifts from explanation to exhortation. He begins, therefore I urge you, and as you all, all have often heard, whenever we see the conjunction, therefore, we should always ask ourselves, what is it therefore? It is an important word because it points to a conclusion drawn from what preceded. So the exhortation Paul will give is based on the theology of the previous 11 chapters and what he has taught in those chapters is the grace of God, the mercies of God in our salvation. Salvation in all of its parts, election, justification, sanctification, ultimately glorification, is all of God. He has helped the helpless, and that is mercy. And that calls for a Christian response. That's what Paul now urges in chapter 12. By the mercies of God, because of all that God has done for you, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Dr. Johnson stated that the presentation of our bodies is like the I do of a wedding vow. It, it's not yield, which has a passive idea, or surrender, which suggests reluctance, it is a joyful I do. And the reason is the mercies of God. They, they are the motivation for that response. In one of his books, F.F. F. Bruce quotes the Scot, Thomas Erskine, who said, in the New Testament, religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. But to have gratitude, we must know what God has done and, and how undeserving we are. We, we can never offer Him a sincere heart until we understand how indebted we really are to His mercy. 
That's the reason that doctrine is so practical, and it is. It is foundational to conduct. Belief always affects behavior. So Paul spent 11 chapters on man's ruin and God's remedy. Now he says, those have, who have received that remedy, those he calls brethren, those who are believers in Jesus Christ, are to respond by being living sacrifices. The idea of, <clears throat> of bloody sacrifices was common in Paul's day. A person would bring an animal to the priest, his sins would be confessed over it, and then the animal would be slain on the altar. <clears throat> Sacrifices were slaughtered. But Paul turns that image into a new one, that of a living sacrifice. We are to offer our bodies to the Lord for spiritual service. Really, we are to present our entire self to God for that, body and spirit. But here the emphasis is on the physical part of our, of our being, our, our bodies literally. And the reason for that was the Greek philosophy of that day, which was really the worldview of that day in the Roman world. The slogan of those Greeks and Romans was, the body is a tomb. They believed that everything material was evil, it was bad, the spiritual was good, and really the ideal to be reached was the freedom of the soul, the freedom of the spirit from the enslavement, the captivity, the tomb of the body. Now that was the common view in that day, and that is utterly contrary to the Bible. The body is part of our person. It, it is important. It was created by God. It will be resurrected. Sanctification, the, the transformation of our person, our character, involves the body. So that is one reason that Paul makes this statement of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. But there was also a need to emphasize that because of the depravity that was so common in that day. This book was written to Gentiles in Rome, Gentile Christians. There were Jews in the congregation, but this was a largely Gentile con congregation. And the Gentiles were notorious for sexual impurity, immorality, degrading behavior. And so Paul addresses that. He knew that if the body was not brought under control and into conformity with the ethical demands of the gospel, then there could be no service to God or to man. Paul urged that in chapter 6. He, he warned against presenting the members of our bodies to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, and literally that that can be translated weapons of unrighteousness. Present them, he said, as instruments of righteousness. Well, that's, that's how we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, by offering each part of ourselves, each part of our body to God. Our eyes and ears are to be offered to God by viewing and listening to what is pure, our hands are to be engaged in good works. Our feet are to take us to pure places. We are to walk God's paths and, and put our hands to useful tasks. In other words, God's servants are to be disciplined and industrious. Living sacrifices, active sacrifices, sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to God. The idea here is, is, is that of the spotless lamb, uh, a lamb without defect, a lamb without blemish. That was the standard for offerings made to God in the Old Testament, and, and our lives are to be that. They're to be without blemish. They are to be holy. But, but our minds, our, our thoughts affect our behavior. We cannot present our bodies as living sacrifices until we first offer our hearts to God sincerely and promptly. 
That's our spiritual service of worship. It's internal. It is, it is of the mind. That, that really is the, the battlefield of the Christian life. It's in the mind. It's the heart that affects the members of our body. So that is what we are to, to strive for, purity in our thoughts and in our behavior. And we can do that. We can be living sacrifices because we have within us the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Literally, He dwells in the hearts of every believer in Jesus Christ. Your heart, as Paul says in Ephesians 1.13, has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. He's present within you. He's He's part of us and He enables us to live for the Lord. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. We're led by the Spirit. Well, that's other, way, other places as well. In John 15 verse 16, the Lord told His disciples that He chose them and He appointed them so that they would go and bear fruit. So that they would go out and be active in the world and be fruitful. Well, we can do that because we are in Him, like, like branches in a vine, as He says at the beginning of chapter 15. Just as the, the branch receives the vital fluid from the tree so that it's alive and it naturally, inevitably bears fruit, so too we have His life in us. We have the life of Jesus Christ in us because we're joined to Him spiritually, and that life is transferred to us through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. They are one. They are distinct in person. But they are one in essence. And the life of Christ is the life of the Spirit. And it's transferred to us to enable us to live the kind of life we're exhorted to live here. But having said that, we, we also are to strive for that, strive to be fruitful, to, to be holy in heart and conduct. That's the emphasis here. It's on what we are to do in response to all that's been done for us and how we've been equipped and all of the grace and mercies that we've received. And when we do that, when we live like that, we will be, as Paul says, acceptable to God, meaning well-pleasing to God. Now that is amazing that, uh, that we who were by nature dead in our sins, haters of God, that's what Paul said back in chapter 8 and verse 7, enemies in rebellion against Him, that, that we could become pleasing to God is quite an amazing statement. But that's the grace of God. And again, that's the motive for offering ourselves to Him as living sacrifices. God's grace. An obedient life is the best life. It is an orderly life. It is a safe life. It's the life that God blesses. The Scriptures teach that. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 27 states, The fear of the Lord prolongs life but the years of the wicked will be shortened. It, that, that itself is good reason to present ourselves to God in this way. But that's not Paul's reason here. That's not the reason he gives for doing what he exhorts us to do. We are to be sacrifices for God out of gratitude for what God has done for us. That's our motive. Not health or personal advantage but thankfulness. One of the best examples of that is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, and the sinful woman who entered a dinner party to express her gratitude to Christ who had saved her. She wasn't invited. She wasn't wanted. She knew that, but she was completely indifferent to those sitting around that table. Now, it wasn't because she was simply indifferent to them, or she had a kind of rough character that uh, was of the nature she doesn't care what people think. That wasn't it at all. She was really oblivious to the 
the uh, hostility toward her because she was so full of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, she had to be there. She wanted to worship Christ. She wanted to worship Christ because she loved him. And so she entered the house of Simon the Pharisee, knelt down at Jesus' dusty feet, and began to weep over them and wipe them with her hair, kiss them, and anoint his feet with perfume. Now the host, as you know, was indignant. So Jesus explained her actions. She loved much because she was forgiven much. That's to be our motive for worship and service. Real gratitude. Thankfulness. Paul calls it our spiritual service of worship. It's, it's not only outward worship, but essentially an, an inner worship given from gratitude. It involves the mind, involves the heart, rather than a, a mechanical routine of merely going through the motions. It's so much of what religion is, even today. Just going through the motions, saying prayers by rote, doing things, holding on to things, objects. God's not pleased with, with worship of that kind. He's not pleased with worship that is only outward. He's not pleased with worship that's only inward either. We must present our bodies to Him for service. But that action must be the result of a sincere heart. Paul explains this further in verse 2 where he speaks of the renewing of our minds. That is where true worship begins. It's, it is essentially inner. It is essentially spiritual. It's essentially of the soul. In the New Testament, religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. So, it begins with the heart, the mind, with, with knowledge uh, of the Savior and, and what He has done for us. Then the heart is offered from gratitude with, uh, that, that we willingly, gladly present to the Lord as service. Paul's exhortation that we present ourselves as a living sacrifice is put in the aorist tense which is the simple past tense. It's a very common <clears throat> tense used in the New Testament when someone speaks of what happened. And uh, it really doesn't mean much more than that, but here the idea is a definite act of dedication. And you may have heard Bible teachers speak about the aorist tense. It's very common to hear that, at least it used to be, and they state that it represents once for all action. And that Paul's instruction here meant to, is meant to be a once-for-all act on our behalf. This decisive act in which we then are completely given over to the service of God. But the aorist tense doesn't mean that. It speaks of an act. The context determines whether uh, the act is a once-for-all act or not. And... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Jesus speaks of, or Paul speaks of the Lord's death for us. And there it's an aorist tense. Well, we know that Christ's death, who died for our sins according to the Scriptures, is a once-for-all act because we know that's the nature of His sacrifice. And that we're told that He died once. It's all He'll die. It's all He needs to die. He finished the work. So we know that from the context, but that's not... A point to be made from the aorist tense because it doesn't mean that. It doesn't suggest that here either. In fact, as we read on, we see that the context makes it very clear that this is a repeated act. This is something that we do daily. It's to be decisive, that's true, but we repeat it daily. As I say, the context supports that. We see that from the commands that are given in verse 2. They're put in the present tense, which has the the, the sense of continuously doing this, repeated action. So daily, routinely, we are to be offering our hearts, our bodies to God for spiritual service. That's what Paul exhorts us to do. And in verse 2, he, 
he gets specific on, on what we must do and what we must avoid in order to present our bodies and offer our hearts as genuine sacrifices to God. We can do that only if we do not conform to this world, but are transformed by the renewing of the mind. In his paraphrase of the New Testament, J.B. Phillips rendered verse 2, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And that's our constant battle, isn't it? Believers in Jesus Christ, those Paul calls brethren, are a new creation. And so we have a new relationship with the world. Paul explains that in chapter 6 of the book of Romans. Through, through Christ's sacrifice, through His death in our place, our old self died. You're not the person you used to be. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're not the unbeliever that you once were. We, we are now in Christ and we share in His life. We have peace with God. We have a relationship with Him, a vital, life-giving relationship, a new relationship with the Lord God. You were slaves of sin, Paul said, but having believed in Christ, having joined yourself to Jesus Christ through faith and faith alone, you became slaves of righteousness. We have been transferred into a new spiritual realm where we have new loyalties. But while the, the, the transfer into the realm of righteousness and life is real, it's not final. We, we're still in the world. And sin is still in us. It's in our bodies. It's in our members, as Paul has explained. And th there, there is still enough of the old life with us, the old nature that the world continues to have an appeal to us, to all of us. And it's able to exert pressure on us. It's able to, to squeeze us into its mold. Now that is the world Paul warns against. It's not the material world when he uses this word. He's not speaking of that. He's not speaking of the earth. He's not speaking of the, the globe, the creation itself. That's God's work. It's good. This world, this word here for world... It, it, it literally is the word age, this age. At the end of chapter 11, Paul wrote, To him be the glory forever. Amen. Forever is literally to the ages. In other words, age upon age throughout eternity, world without end. To, to, may, may the glory of God go on forever. But here, it, it, the word is simply age. Singular. One age, not eternal succession of ages. In other words, it's a limited period of time. The world that Paul warns against here is temporal. And if the world is temporal, all of the promises that it makes are temporal. They don't last. It is temporal and doomed because of sin. We live in a fallen world that has affected everything. Someone defined the world as the sin-dominated, death-producing realm to which the natural unbelieving man belongs. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of acting. It's largely materialism. It is the desire for things. And I suppose, having said that it's largely materialism, I should qualify that by saying it depends on what part of the world you live in. But certainly in this part of the world, the Western world, the, the world is, as Paul is using it here, largely materialism. It is the desire for things, the desire for more possessions, for power and prestige, for position and acceptance in the eyes of the world. But, but basically, I think it is self-centeredness. It's putting self first and, and living for this age. The very opposite of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. A worldly person is what John Murray called a time server. It's a person who has, has self and the temporal as the, the center and the motive of his or her life. James Boyce expressed the values of our day as 
be as healthy as you can, live as long as you can, get as rich as you can. Now that's not a bad summary of our values today. We are constantly bombarded by the world's propaganda to be that way, to adopt those values as our own and, and to have all of that as our goal in life. That's what we're to strive for and it is appealing. That's success. And I, I will agree, there's a large measure of success in that, in achieving these kinds of things. But that's not the great success of life, and that's not what we've been put here to do. We've been put here to worship and serve the Lord God. But we have this constant pressure to seek other things, to seek the temporal and live for it. And, and exposure to that over time, which is constant, Exposure to that has its effect. I got an illustration of that some years ago when I took my, one of my daughters to Paris. It was a quick trip, but we were able to, to visit most of the, the, the typical tourist sites. But there was one that was a little different. We went on a tour of the Paris sewer. Um, maybe not a typical site. But it's famous. I mean, it's the longest sewer system in the world. That, that makes you want to see it. <clears throat> and there's a little romance con connected to it. It was uh, through the sewers of Paris that, that uh, Jean Valjean escaped in Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. So that was very popular, the, the musical at that time. And so we paid our money and we descended into the sewers of Paris to explore the uh, subterranean tunnels. And, and very shortly we realized that we were in a real sewer. Uh, we pressed on, but uh, it wasn't long before I noticed my daughter had put her scarf over her, her face, and she was, uh, I could see her eyes, and they were showing a great deal of distress, and I was beginning to get a, little, get a little woozy. And so after about 15 minutes, we made our way out. But as we were leaving, we stopped at a gift shop. That seems like a strange thing to have in a sewer, but <laughs> there it was. And as I looked at the man in charge, I thought, this guy seems fine down here. He's completely unaffected by the atmosphere. But he was in it all day. He had acclimated. He had conformed. And I'm sure if I had remained long enough, I would have conformed as well. But I didn't want to. I knew there was something much better above Blue skies, clean air, and so we didn't stay. Now there's a, an analogy in that because the, the same is true for us spiritually. The best things are above. Set your mind on the things above, Paul told the Colossians. And yet the strange thing is we have a real longing to, to stay in the, the spiritually subterranean realm of this world. It's attractive to us. We're always tempted to go back, to look back like Lot's wife. And if we do, if we linger, we soon acclimate. We begin to conform. So Paul warns us here with some negative instruction, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this age. Don't let it press you into its mold. That's all he says. But as you think about it, the force of the warning is powerful. This is just an age. It's fleeting. Nothing that it promises lasts. And nothing that it promises satisfies. We are a new creation. We are round pegs and the world is a square hole. We don't fit. We can't fit. Paul speaks about that at the end of Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 14. The, I have been crucified to the world, he said, and the world to me. The world looks upon me and says, you're a dead man. We have no interest in you. You're crucified, put to shame. The man you once were, this ambitious young rabbi, we can admire that. But what you are, you're dead to us. And Paul says, fine, you're dead to me. I'm a different person. So it's foolish to conform. 
That's the warning. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is about sanctification. It is about the spiritual change that occurs within us. It's a work of God, but we're to respond to that work and all of the blessings that he's given us in, in genuine effort. The word that Paul uses here for transformed is, is familiar to all of us. It is literally, the Greek word is metamorpho, from which we get the word metamorphosis. A, a change of form, as in a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. This is the same word that both Matthew and Mark used in their Gospels to describe the transfiguration of Christ. Peter and James and John went up with the Lord on a high mountain and he was transfigured or transformed before them. His face shone like the sun, his garments became white as light. That suggests the change Paul is referring to here. It's not just nonconformity. It is that. He's made that very clear. That's the negative, but there's a positive aspect to it as well. And the positive side of the transformation is we're becoming increasingly like Jesus Christ, increasingly obedient, righteous. But that is a process. Uh, Paul puts this command in the present tense, as I, as I indicated earlier, which indicates that this is a continuing process. That's what sanctification is. A process that continues throughout our lives. We will never in this life, in this body, in this situation, before the grave, reach perfection. And it's, it's a false and frustrating hope to think that we can do that. There are people who have taken this, this chapter about and understood it as making a decisive, definitive break in devotion to Christ, and, have, had, and their lives have been transformed. And that, that is true. I don't doubt that. But they're not perfect. And none of us is perfect. We are striving daily and will to the end. And then glory will come, and it will come. That's the end of the process. And that, that end comes immediately. We are glorified. But in the meantime, in this life, the process goes on. And that is both humbling and encouraging. Humbling because we never arrive and, and we can never take pride in our achievements. Christianity in the minds of some is all about doing and not doing and being proud about it. I don't think anyone would say that, but that's the consequence. They get proud, proud about what they've done and who they are. But none of our achievements are ever perfect. They're never complete. They involve far more than deeds. And, and they're never, ever a reason for pride. But there is reason for encouragement because we are being changed gradually by God's grace. It is happening. It's happening in your life now. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are being transformed. And so we're to strive toward that and keep striving to be transformed, changed inwardly and outwardly, made more like Christ and less like this present age. The way we do that, that the how of the transformation is by the renewing of our mind, by changing the way we think, what someone called the reprogramming of our mind. And we do that by filling our minds with the things of God, by setting our minds on the things above. When we do that, we think correctly about the other things of the world. Uh, Paul speaks of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 where he wrote, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorpho into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. In other words, as we behold the glory of Jesus Christ in the Scriptures, as we contemplate Him and His glory, as we take that into our minds, we're transformed into the likeness of Christ. Our minds are affected. They are reprogrammed. Our thoughts and our desires become increasingly like Christ's so that our character 
changes and we act and live differently. Why would a person want to leave the, the dark tunnels and noxious fumes below the city for the bright skies and clean air above? Why would anyone even think of doing that? Well, because we know that what's up there is better than what's down there. And it's the same spiritually. We gladly leave behind the things below for the rarefied spiritual air above because we know it's better. And we know that because our mind has been renewed. That's God's purpose in transforming us by the renewing of our minds so that we will seek Him, so that we will offer ourselves as a, a living and holy sacrifice to Him. Are you being transformed? Paul says, so that you may prove the things of God, is that happening? Now that's what he urges here. He says you are being transformed. He says, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, so that you'll be able to figure out the things of God. But we do that by striving to do that. And God's will is very simple. It's obedience. But sometimes, as you know, and you find in the decision-making that you make, <clears throat> things aren't always black and white. There are gray aspects to all of that. And, and knowing what is best by experience and learning is how we prove these things. Learning from the Word of God and through our experience we do that over time, but as we do that, as we prove what's good and perfect, we, we learn that uh, obedience is far better than conformity. We, we will prove it's pleasing and perfect. The Christian who offers his body to God as a living sacrifice will not come to the end of his life or the end of her life and, and, and feel cheated. Not at all will come to the end of it and be fully satisfied. So, again, are you doing that? How are you living? What are you conforming to, the world or Christ? You'll never, never find satisfaction in this world, in this life, until you offer your heart and present your body as a sacrifice. If you haven't trusted in Christ, you are living the opposite life, and you are living on borrowed time. John wrote, the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So do His will. And fundamentally, His will is believe in Christ. He receives and forgives all who do. That's, that's the promise. Put it to the test. Put him to the test. Prove it by believing. As the psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And if you do, you will find that to be true. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to live to serve him faithfully. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage. What an appropriate passage for this time of the year as we approach Thanksgiving. We pray that it will be a happy time for everyone. But this reminds us of why we, of all people, we who were once enemies, we who were, as Paul said, hostile toward God, have been, as it were, arrested, changed, given new life, new minds, new hearts. We are, we are different from what we were by your grace and you have given us not only the best life here in this world, life of reconciliation with you and, and fellowship with you, but we have a glorious, glorious future beyond comprehension. Why? Well, it's not because of us. It's all because of you. Your grace, your mercy, we thank you for that. Make us thankful, Father. Remind us of these things that we might live well for you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.